before I forget, which is possible that I will, next week, huh, we start in, we, have, we haven't talked through a book of the Bible for a really long time, but we felt we should do Ephesians. So next week we're doing Ephesians, and Anthony Hilder is kicking that off, and there's a group of us that are going to do it. So there's going to be Anthony, Joe, Simon, Tim Quant, and me. So I don't think Tim's here, but if you're in that group, could you stand up too? Is Tim here? Tim. Tim Quant, no. You're... Hi, Naomi, yeah. But could you stand for him? So, <laughs> there you go. And Simon there. Just if you're near them, just pray for them, because we just want this to be a massive success, a big breakthrough moment for lots of people. And uh, some of it's going to get communicated out to you. So we've got the headings, we've got the preachers. It's all going to be awesome. So be praying for that in the week. Praying for Anthony, who's kicking it off, doing the intro, the why of Ephesians, the background. It's going to be good. It's going to be... It's, it's tough to have a favorite book in the Bible, but I think it's one of my favorites. It kind of pulls so much together in one, one space. So that's good. Um, okay, I've got, I've got some slides. Could, could you, uh, Gideon, could I have the first one up there? There you go. I'm talking about hands today. So this it could involve children as well. If you have hands, could you just raise your hands? Just wave them around. If you've got hands, be good to know. Check them out. Check out the person next to you. Do you have hands? Okay, we can pray. If you, if you need hands, we can pray for you. Um, <laughs> oh, so many things to do. Uh, the, I've done that. At our, our conference now, a few weeks ago, we had, we had an amazing time. And, and particularly the Saturday night, which several uh, through the weeks different ones have referred to and that's intentional there was this moment in worship but it was a long moment where we just got in this space we'd not been in for a long time and it, the, the only adequate word is in the glory it was it was his presence of course it's his presence but it was an intensity to it um i mean i was weeping several people were just i wasn't leaping about i was just weeping and actually, for three days afterwards in my prayer time, I was just weeping. I was just saying, God, this is what I was made for. This is what we are made for. Please don't take this away. Or please, I know you don't want to take it away. Please show us how to receive this, host this, walk with this, so that this becomes our common ground. Because I, I know the Bible. The Bible says we go from glory to glory, not from glory to... It's not meant to do that. It's meant to do that. Yes, uh, and so part of what's been happening over the last few weeks is people have been sharing things that, that we, we asked Seth particularly, also Julian a little bit, well, how do you walk in this? How, how, do we, how, do we, how do we do that? How do we sustain that? And so you had a week, a couple of weeks ago, Jan did about walking with prophetic words. So we had a, a half an hour prophetic word over us as a church and individuals that we've sent out through... Uh, church suite to you which was amazing and so we, we've had a talk on stewarding the prophetic and working that out and walking that out and last week Joe did a great job on on blocking our wells and keeping our well on blocks it felt like our corporate and maybe some of our individual wells you know because the Holy Spirit's in us and he loves to bubble up he springs up inside of us like a fountain and some of us had been feeling our well was blocked corporately and individually and and and, and Seth had said, here's some things on keeping your well unblocked. And Joe did a good job of speaking to us about keeping our well unblocked last week. So if you, if you weren't able to hear that, this is, this is us honoring and valuing the input we've had as a community. And not just we ran a conference, they've gone away and we forgot what they said. No, God spoke to us and did stuff to us and amongst us that, that we, really, we, we, we were really giving attention to. So... My, I'm on that today, that same theme of how do we, and, and really a couple of things that Seth <coughs> encouraged us with. So there was about 20 of us, the wider leadership team with Seth, on the Sunday night, the conference was over, and we were like, Seth, how do you keep this going? And his church has been in this move for probably two decades. So he is going around the world sort of now sharing how he's kind of kept that alive. And one of the things he said to us was about, how you keep your well unblocked 
and, and a couple of other things he said, and I'm going to try and cover one quickly and take a bit longer about hands, okay? Is, it, is this making sense so far? Right. So, so that in worship, I couldn't get this out of my head that it's a, it's a phrase we got from Pete Carter, but it's true for us, is that we are a beachhead for freedom. We are a beachhead for freedom in Scotland. And, and, and really the phrase, you know, none of us were alive in the Second World War, but it's familiar enough to know about the D-Day landing. Everybody know what that is or that was. And, and how do you establish a beachhead for freedom? So here you have pretty much all of mainland Europe overrun by, by the Nazis, the Third Reich, brutally murdering Jews. So there's an oppressive regime and they wanted to come here. They wanted to take over. And for many, many people in that time, it looked like they would. But there was this great plan cooked up between the, the Americans and the British and the other allies that, that were around to establish and retake Europe. But to take Europe, they had to establish a beachhead. And so there's various beaches. There was Gold Beach and Sword Beach and Utah Beach and... And, and wave upon wave of soldiers landed on these beaches. And then they established these mulberry harbors so the engineers came in because it's no good having an initial wave that isn't supported, otherwise the invasion fails. But the outcome of establishing those beachheads for freedom was that Europe was set free. The whole nation was set free. And I'm quite emotional about this. It, it takes some guts to be the first off the boat. You know that you may not be going home. You know your foot may not even touch the sand. But somebody's got to be first off the boat or there'll be no freedom for millions. But it also takes courage and tenacity and skill to build a mulberry harbor in an ocean that didn't and a sea that was not fit for a harbor. And there would have been no freedom without the guys that came behind and established the beachhead from those that were jumping off. Are, are you with me? So you can't, it's often we honor the risk, the riskiest one is, seems to be the first one, but actually without all of it, none of it would have happened. Do you see? And sometimes I think we think that we only honor the, the strike force, and it's really important that's not how we think. It is important we honor them because without the first off the boat, none of us would walk into freedom, but without the people who can build the environment, none of us would keep our freedom. So that, that, that involves everybody in this room and beyond, all right? So it's really important that we honor the first responders so medical terms, they, get their, they may not be the best doctors, they may not even be the, the most trained ambulance personnel, but those guys that get there and do basic first aid can save a person's life so that the ambulance can get there and the experts can get their hands on them and they can get them to hospital. And that means they stay alive. Thank God for the doctors, but thank God for the first responders. So... In, this, in, in, this, in freedom, everybody gets to play and everybody gets to be honored. And if we dishonor any part, then we won't make it. Let me say that again. We won't make it. If we criticize the people who go first and look weird and scary, we will lose our freedom. I think it was Nelson Mandela. He probably wasn't the first to say this, but if anyone in our nation isn't free, none of us are free in the fullest sense of that word. And Simon did such a good job this morning of saying, we are free. Right? We have a structure, but that is not to confine us, that's to help us. Yeah, we're not constrained by it, we're meant to be released by having a program so we know what happens and hopefully we know that the children are getting looked after and all of that kind of thing. <clears throat> so I want to... I, I want to start before we, this is all connected up, it'll, it'll make sense hopefully. If you, if you know, so in the spirit realm there are first responders. In, in, in the realm of the work of the spirit there are people 
who sense, feel, get activated by the Holy Spirit ahead of the rest of us. Do you, you, you know that feeling? You're like, and it was happening this morning. Some of us are sitting there going, what's going on here? And some of you are like, yeah, Jesus! And some people are shouting and some people are sh- trembling and some of us are going, wow, they're the first responders. That doesn't mean you're left out. That means they're just breaking ground for us. So everybody in the body of Christ is a servant of the rest of the body of Christ. And believe, believe me, why I got you to pray for me is it scary to stick your neck out. And that song we were singing, the second song in about lead me on. Oh, Catherine, help me with the words because it was oceans. Sp- <laughs> this come. Yeah. I'll come to you. I will. Come. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. I walk upon the water wherever you will call me. Lead me deeper. I can't, I can't say it. Let me deeper where my feet can go. And my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Huh. That was messing with me. I'd like the Holy Spirit first responders in Hope Church to be really free because they are like the first ones over the top and they make a space for everybody else. Now what your freedom looks like doesn't have to be what their freedom looks like. I'm going to say that again for the 400th time in this church. What their freedom looks like doesn't have to be what your freedom looks like. If they're not free, you're not going to be in freedom. Because what happens when God is moving by His Spirit, some people step in first, and that can be in silence, or it can be in waving a flag, or it can be the first one to dance, or it might be someone who claps, or it might be someone who lies on the floor, or it might be someone who kneels, or it might be someone who weeps, or it might be someone who shouts, or it might be someone who groans, or it might be someone who just does something I haven't thought of. Because he can do the things we haven't thought of. I mean, there is a verse in the Bible where, uh, where Ezekiel is lifted from the floor by his hair by the Holy Spirit. That's not something I'd thought of for Sunday morning. But if God, if true freedom is in the presence of God. So God has to be free to be God. For us to be free, he has to, we have to allow him to be free. Are you following the logic of this? So the first point is that we are in a posture of we allow him to be free. Then that is something that ignites some amongst us which creates an atmosphere of power and freedom for all of us. Because everybody gets to play. Everybody's a servant of one another. Everybody's important. If you're first over the top, You've given your life for nothing if the people aren't coming behind you to establish the beachhead. Does it, is this making sense? So, just right now, I, I'd like, if you know you're a, you're a bit of a Holy Spirit junkie, easy drinker, lightning rod person, you either know that or you've been told that, and this isn't everybody in this room and that all the people who are going to stay sitting down, God bless you, we absolutely need you without you this is not going to happen. But I'd like the ones that I've just described to stand up for a moment. Can, can, we, can we release these guys? Some of these people, I'm like, oh, I know God's just about to show up because I hear someone in the room and I'm like, I haven't felt it yet, but it's coming. There it is. <laughs> there it is. There he is. So we need your help, guys. We really we need you in this church. We need you to be plugged in, 
turned on, electrified, lightning rods, drunken, crazy. Amen? Come on, guys. Let's pray for them because God is going to plug them in today and we're all going to need this. So let's just pray they would get plugged in, they would get scunnered. Yeah, they would get they would get what they need right now to help the rest of us get where we need to go. We have a prophetic word over this church that it will be more fun to come here than going to the pub. Um, We have prophetic words about fire on the building. That means we have to be happy with drinking and fire in the building. So, uh, all right, I'm going to say something else. I'm going to, I'm going to preach the rest of this message now. Feel free to interrupt me anytime, you guys, if you want to take a seat. We maybe even call on you if things just go a little bit off track. Huh. Oh. So that was one of the things Seth said to us is on, 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 are the, on are the easy drinkers, on are the lightning rods in your midst. And, and the other thing connected to that was hands. We all, we all have them. And if you've got a Bible, I hope you have a Bible to church. You turn to Hebrews 6. I'm I'm going to teach you some doctrine this morning. (laughs) Sounds big, doesn't it? It is. Hebrews 6 and verse 1. Oh, there we go. In the ESV. We're going to do 1 to 3. So, Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. And of instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection from the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. So he's writing to the the, the Hebrews, whoever the author is, and saying... Actually, there's a level of truth and revelation and understanding I can't actually bring to you yet because you need to get the basics down. And when the basics are down, God will give you like a building permit to go on from here. And here's, here's the basics. Here's the basic doctrines that you need to know. And, and interestingly enough, we've been touching on some of these in, in recent weeks. We've talked about it says washings in this translation, but baptisms is the common translation. We've talked about baptisms. We've talked about baptism in the Spirit. We've talked about uh, baptism in water. We've talked about repentance now several weeks ago. And alongside all these weighty topics, including <clears throat> resurrection from the dead and eternal judgment, is the issue of the doctrine of laying on of hands. So that's, that's standing amongst some pretty auspicious company, isn't it? The doctrine of laying on of hands is being listed as a basic teaching for the Christians that they need to know about before they can go on and build further. And it's put alongside resurrection from the dead. So this is maybe more important than I thought it was. Yeah? So these... These and what we do with them is a doctrine. The laying on of hands. Could you flick up my next slide? Because I want to be clear what we mean by this. We don't mean this. (laughs) Do you put the next one up? We don't mean this. And the next one, it's more this, is what we're going to be talking about today. Okay, just go to the next one, please. There should be one more slide. Is there one more? That one. Just, just a hand. We have them. Oh, they're awesome. And there's a doctrine attached to your hand. Wow. Okay. 
So we move, to go into deeper truth, we've got to know what this is about with our hands. So the Old Testament origins of this hand laying on thing is very interesting. So one of the first places you find it is in making the sin offerings. So they lay just before they killed the bull or, or, the, or they sent the, the, the scapegoat off, they would lay hands on it and then they'd kill it. And at one level, what they believed was they were imparting their sin to the offering so that when the offering died, their sin was atoned for. But uh, there was another level of teaching amongst the, uh, uh, amongst the rabbis which said even a bit more than just when I do this, so you're just sitting there, see, when I do this, I'm imparting my sin to you so that when they cut your throat, that blood cleanses my sin. There's a, there's a, there was a school of thought which is when they laid hands on that animal that actually part of the life of the person entered the animal so that when the animal died, the person died. And when we teach about the cross, we're not saying that Jesus died for us. We're saying that he died as us. So that, that has echoes of what happened at the cross. So this, impart, this, this thing that they did with these animals was more than just carrying my sin. You're actually taking something of me and you're, you're dying my death for me. Wow. Poor old John, do we need some more people sitting on the ends here? I'm just going <coughs> to... I think it would be Matty next. I'm coming. Now, it's hard to find the hand-laying bit in this, but there's, there's wrapped up in this is the idea of impartation of generational blessing. So he doesn't always say that hands were laid on, but implied there is. So when um, Jacob steals his father, Jake, his father Isaac's blessing by dressing up as his brother, there's a blessing that comes out of the mouth of the dad to the son that cannot be taken back, that shapes his life prophetically and in blessing for the rest of his life. And probably there was, there was touch involved in that moment. So there's a whole bigger picture thing going on here in Scripture is this principle of impartation. So there's impartation to the animal of something that is mine that I don't want, and there's an impartation of something that is in the family line from the father to the sons that he wants to give away. And the third thing is in commissioning, which are clearly our examples in Scripture of the laying on of hands for commissioning. And the first one you'll find is where Moses is told by God to invest some of his authority into Joshua. Literally, he says, take some of the authority I have given you, this is what God says to Moses, and I want you to invest it in Joshua, and he lays hands on him, and it says in Deuteronomy 34 verse 4 that Joshua was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid hands on him and imparted authority. Wow. So Moses has something from God, and he lays hands on Joshua, and Joshua receives wisdom and authority and anointing from that laying on of hands. Isn't that incredible? And this then started to become a Jewish tradition passed on by, <coughs> by the rabbis called the smicha. And smicha began, became known as <coughs> authority. It was, was like synonymous with authority. So if you'd been smickered, you had authority. So as the rabbis trained people up, people who were allowed to, to interpret Scripture had hands laid on them by senior rabbis, and they were now had the smicker, so the authority to interpret Scripture themselves. Just the scribes didn't have that authority. So when Jesus went around speaking with, when they said, he speaks as one with authority, what the crowds are saying, he's speaking as one with smicker. And why the authorities had a problem with, his, with him is that they hadn't smeekered him. 
he hadn't been authorized by their laying on of hands. He was functioning from direct authority from heaven when he started to teach and interpret the scripture. But smika is the word. And it, the literal word means to fill your hands. Splosh. It's in the Bible. Here it comes. Splash! <laughs> So we have these, this impartation of blessing. We have this impartation of sin and life that you, you want to atone for, you want rid of, and you have this impartation of authority and wisdom all there in the, in the historic tradition of, of the Old Testament and the Jewish tradition culminating in this idea of in, the, in the passing on of the authority to interpret the, the Scriptures as they had them, the Torah. Amazing. And the, the, the fourth thing that is, this is in the realm of, listen carefully. In 2 Kings 13, 15 to 17, Elisha is lying, dying, and the king is panicking because of the enemy, the Syrians, and he's like, oh, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? So that's, that's my, my paraphrase. What are we doing? What are we doing? Help, help, we're all going to die. That kind of thing. So Elisha says, get your bow and arrow out. Open the window. And Elisha lays hands on his hands. It says this very carefully. It says, Lay hand, he laid hands on him. And he says, shoot the arrow through the window. And he shoots it. And he says, that's your victory over Syria. You're going to kill them all. And then he says, take the arrows and strike the ground with them. So he does it three times and Elisha gets annoyed. He says, that's, you're only going to defeat them three times. You should have hit the ground more. What's happening here? Here you have this established prophet laying hands on the king so that what are normal actions become supernatural prophetic actions. There's an impartation of prophetic significance and prophetic anointing to some normal actions that then become the victories that this king will have. Isn't that amazing? There's a prophetic impartation through the laying on of hands that suddenly make his things he's doing incredibly significant and impactful. They become prophetic acts that release victory to a nation. Wow. I don't quite have a name for that, but it's a prophetic impartation that gives significance and power to normal actions that become prophetic actions. So all this is in the Old Covenant, all this is in the Old Testament, and the New Testament believers pick up Remember, most of them at first are Jewish believers, so they have this history. They know about the Smeaker. They know about Joshua they know, and, and Moses. They know, they know about Elisha. They, they knew the prophets. They knew their history. They knew about that this could be more than just, I'm, w I'm with you, brother. So, so this association and affirmation is good, and in our culture, we, we kind of, pat one another on the back and give each other sideways hugs in a sense of I'm standing with you he's having a tough time or I want to encourage you tell you I love you that's all good but they saw much more than that in the action of laying on of hands their their history is coming with them into this new thing called the new testament the resurrection of Jesus <coughs> grace and all the rest of it and they're bringing this history <coughs> with them all right and in that history they believe hands do more than they seem able to do. Just look at your hand a moment. There it is, a humble hand, able to do many things. You can write, you can cut wood, you can sew, you can many, many things with this. Brush your hair, do your buttons up. But the doctrine of laying on of hands says something can travel through your hands that is some of heaven flowing through you into someone next to you.
The humble hand becomes a mighty instrument of impartation. Couple, couple of minutes. So New Testament, what happened with the hands thing? Well, first, first thing we see is Jesus lays hands on lots of sick people. They all get well. The first, first mention of this in the New Testament, and this happens often. You just read your, read, read your Bibles. You'll see that Jesus lays hands on the sick often, and they get better. And then he commissions us and says to us in Mark 16, verse 18, lay hands on the sick and they will recover. You know, we are never told to pray for the sick. This is a weird thing. We pray for the sick all the time, but we're told not to pray for the sick. Well, we're not told not to pray for the sick. We're not told to pray for the sick. We're told to heal the sick and lay hands on the sick and they will get better. So if someone not well this morning, just, just someone sitting here not feeling well, there you go. Next, next to, just don't say anything. Lay hands on them and they will get well. Anybody else? Just you can listen and lay hands. You don't need to talk because it doesn't say pray. It says lay hands. There you go. Just, just lay hands on that guy, whatever it is, injury, just lay hands, and we can keep going. So that's the first thing. New Testament, laying on of hands <coughs> for healing. Number two, like what happened with Joshua and Moses, commissioning the impartation of favor and authority to act. So in the, one of the most famous ones is in Acts 6, where the apostles commission the servants or the some people call them the deacons to wait on tables and they lay hands on them so they're authorized to serve in that way and we did that last week we lay hands on Jess who's our now communications leader we laid hands on new new leaders of new small groups because we're commissioning them and imparting to them authority and anointing to lead their small groups they're serving us all and we're blessing them and appointing them in that way there's also the commissioning in the sense of sent on mission that's called by God. So Barnabas and Paul were commissioned and sent by the Antioch church. And before they went away, they fasted and laid hands on them. And they went and they did this incredible mission and planted churches through uh, Asia Minor and the, sort of that eastern end of the, of the Mediterranean. They were commissioned. And when we set in elders... We're following on the same thing. So 1 Timothy 5.22 in the context of eldership says don't lay hands on someone suddenly or quickly. And the point is don't give someone authority to lead in the church who hasn't been tested and trained and isn't ready for it because then you're going to be in trouble. But there is, when we did our new elders now back January last year, there was an impartation of authority through the laying on of hands and a commissioning to lead this church from heaven through the laying on of human hands. The elders of this church have favor and authority from God to do what they've been called to do. And we did that by laying hands on them, both Existing elders and congregation, you, you guys are guilty. You got involved in this. You laid hands on us at that time. And thirdly, of the four things, there's the impartation of the Spirit through the laying on of hands. <laughs> How does that work? How does Holy Spirit, how does Holy Ghost get out of the palm into the soul. You know, has, has, I mean, my hands are not feeling particularly juiced up at the minute, and it's like, here's a hand. But this doctrine teaches us that there is spiritual power and significance in your hand. Use it wisely. You're like, well, who am I? You know, I don't have much. No, well, that's an identity issue, <coughs> which we've covered many times here. Excuse me. You're a son of God. You're a daughter of the king. He's given you his Holy Spirit. You have authority to change atmospheres, speak truth, impart life, raise the dead, heal the sick. That's what you can do. That's who you are. Whether Not based on how you feel today, based on who he made you 2,000 years ago.
How many of you believe that Jesus died and rose from the dead? That means you're awesome. Because he didn't do it just to forgive you of your sins, it did you to make you or remake you as a son and daughter. And that happened at the cross that you all believe in. So it's an established reality. It's like there's a gold ring on my finger, my wedding ring. <coughs> Whether you believe that or not isn't going to make that more gold. It is gold. And it has, it has one of those things on the inside of it to prove it. <coughs> You're like, oh, I don't feel like gold. No, you just are gold. Whether you're feeling it, believing it, as sure as that's gold, so are you. Anyway, that's rabbit trail and I'm running out of time. So everybody can impart the Spirit. In Acts 8, 17, the apostles are praying for the, them in Samaria and something is happening and it doesn't record exactly what's happening, but the sorcerer Simon offers money for the ability to pass the power on like they were doing through their hands and the people were prophesying and speaking in tongues same happens in Acts 19 but the spirit can be received for the first time and also <coughs> for other times because we're encouraged to be being filled aren't we so these are accounts of the first filling but why not a second or third or 500th filling through the laying on of hands Why not? Why is it not okay to receive the Spirit through the laying on of hands? What's wrong with that? Can anybody say anything wrong with that? It's just... I have the power to lay hands on people and they're going to get whacked by the Holy Spirit who loves them. You have the power to lay hands... Now, whether you're a lightning rod or whether you're one of those that's building... B building the, the Mulberry Harbors, your hands can, lay out, can be laid on someone else and they're going to get the Holy Spirit. They're going to get more spirit. They're going to get more blessing. Whether you feel like you're a lightning rod or not, that's not the point. You are gold. And if you have the gold, you have the hands. And if you have the hands, Holy Spirit can move through you to them. Do you see? You don't have to be going to be someone who can then do that. In fact, you may not do that ever and lay hands on someone and they do. That's okay, isn't it? I, I've, the, the, the final one is impartation of gift. So this comes up several times, one, particularly to Timothy, who's told to fan into flame the gift which is in you through the laying on of my hands. <clears throat> And in Romans 1.11, Paul doesn't talk about laying our hands, but he's eager to impart spiritual gift to the church to strengthen the church. So again, there's this implication that what he can't do through a written letter he wants to do physically amongst them is impart. So Timothy got a gift because Paul, and in this case some elders, laid hands on him and he's told to fan the flame up. If we're going to pass on our inheritance, we've got to lay hands on one another. We've got to give away what we have in order for it to grow because some of us are sitting here waiting for God, will you please give me the gift of healing? Will you please give me the gift of prophecy? What, what would be helpful if you went to someone who you thought had it and got them to lay hands on you because actually the way that this gets transmitted is through other people, not just direct from heaven to you. And that makes us dependent on the body yeah, like I asked you, would you pray for me? I, I needed some strengthening. And it came through other people. Hello? A spiritual gift that strengthened me. The mercy and grace that comes through the laying on of hands. Anybody in the room need a bit of strengthening? That means that's you by putting your hand up, you're not going, I am weak and feeble. I'm putting my no, you say, I just could do with some strengthening today. That's what you're saying, all right? Put your hand up. Okay, if you're near if you're near someone with their hand up, look at your hand and think, This is an awesome weapon of impartation of encouragement in the hands of the Lord. Just say that to your hand. This is an awesome weapon of encouragement to impart strength to my friend in the name of Jesus. 
And then just, just lay hands on someone who's next to you and say, encourage them, Lord, fill them, Lord. That's what I need to do. I need to change the hand I'm holding the mic with. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa. <clears throat> there's more. There's always more. There's more to be had. There's more of His presence to experience. There's more glory. <laughs> there's more you can give you know what you can give away more than you've got I know this is really I don't know how this works but I've had people come up to me because I do move in healing and I've seen lots of people healed and I can think of two occasions where people have come up to me and said would you impart the gift of healing to me and I've said of course I'd be delighted to do, delighted to do that and I've prayed for them and then they email me and they say Wow, that was amazing. Just look at what happened. I'm like, I've never done that. I can remember one guy and he's like, oh, I used to move in such amazing healings and it's all gone, it's all just gone down the, down the pan recently. And would you pray for me just to reactivate this gift? Oh, of course, I'd love to do that. And then he texts me about his Sunday service. And I'm like, this isn't fair. How did he get more than I, or, than I had? But that's how this, it grows in the giving. So he's thinking, well, how can I give away encouragement to someone who needs encouragement when I'm not feeling very encouraged? Have you ever been encouraged? Have you ever been encouraged? Just even once, that's enough. You can give it away and your encouragement will increase as you bring encouragement to them. So... <clears throat> We're out of time. Would you, would you just stand? That would be, be really great if you would do that. So, I don't know, just, just, just put your hands out in front of you for a moment. And Father God, thank you for our hands. And thank you that they're more than just flesh and bone and nerves and sinews. <clears throat> Thank you that we can lay hands on the sick, we can lay hands on one another, we can you can use our hands to stir up gifts, to impart gifts. So what we would love to do over time is just lay hands on people more than we do already and maybe not wait till like Simon's encouraging us to be free so it could happen in worship you know nobody's going to come you're deep in worship your eyes are shut nobody's going to come along and slam their hand on on your head without asking all right that's not what we're doing here but there may be times where someone must come can I just lay hands on you and really what we're saying if we're walking in this door we're expecting to have an encounter with Jesus and we're all here to help one another have an encounter with Jesus. Amen? And that can sometimes just be singing a song in worship, could just be through the words of the preach, could be because someone lays hands on you that you have an encounter with Jesus.